Hello everybody and you're very welcome to the 2020 For Britain virtual conference. Now I'm afraid because of COVID restrictions we can't actually be together and I deeply regret that because it's always a highlight of my year being able to come along and to host your conference for you. I feel very honoured to have been invited to virtually host it. So although I won't get to see you individually, I know that uh, many of you will be uh, watching this and will be very interested in some of the great speeches that we've got coming up from uh, quite a diverse range of different speakers. And last but not least, of course, we have the party leader, Anne-Marie Waters, who will be launching the new party manifesto. So much to look forward to. Stick with us as we go through the, uh, the conference. I first met our next guest speaker a couple of years ago, actually, in the, uh, the heart of darkness, the European Parliament, when she, along with indeed Anne-Marie and others, were, uh, were speaking uh, on the subject of free speech. Uh, I've been very proud to call her my friend and ally. Um, she is a lady who has suffered egregiously at the hands of the uh, the media, and she'll tell you all about that. But through all, throughout all her uh, trials and tribulations, she's remained a proud and defiant patriot of the highest order. So please join me in welcoming Amy Mech. Hi, this is Amy Mack. I am so honored to be here today at the For Britain Party uh, Conference. I wish so much we were doing this in person, but if you are anything like us in the United States, we are all supposed to be imprisoned in our homes. So uh, I look forward to this madness ending soon. And uh, with that said, thank you. And um, Anne Marie is such a leader and an inspiration to so many of us around the world. She's one of the few brave politicians who's speaking honestly about the threats we are facing in the Western world today, despite the consequences. Um, Anne-Marie has been sounding the warning alarms for years about the threats we're facing with third world mass migration, with the radicalized hard left, and with their unholy alliance with Islamic supremacists. Um, these migrants that are being imported into our nations have had very little interest in assimilating into Western laws, cultures, or our traditions. They uh, have been being used by left-wing politicians to tear down the fabric of our sovereign nations and to put their parties, the left-wing parties, in permanent majority forever. So despite the threats that Anne-Marie has faced for warning these alarms and uh, the smear campaign she's had to endure by the left-wing media, she has never relented and never stopped trying to educate the world on these threats and has devoted her life selflessly to um, trying to help us all. So for that, I am forever thankful. Uh, she has continued in this quest to expose the truth and defend not only her country, but to inspire each of us around the world to protect our own countries, our own cultures, and our own Judeo-Christian values from the threats of the left and their Islamic supremacists. So I focus my time in the United States on reporting on a lot of these threats and heroes like Amory Waters who are speaking out. Um, my goal is to give Americans an insight into the, the international political arena. I've kind of tried to awaken Americans to what is taking place and happening in Europe uh, with the hopes that the United States does not go down this same self-destructive suicidal path that Europe has. So aiding the and abetting the West, I mean the left-wing leaders in the West, are their media. And I've devoted a lot of my efforts to reporting on the threats that people like truth tellers like Anne Marie and people in her party face every day for dissenting, for being in a dissenting voice against the left-wing uh, agenda, 
Aiding and abetting the destruction of the West is the weaponized left-wing media. I've spent a lot of my time uh, reporting on the threats uh, that truth-tellers like Amory Waters and people in her party face every day for challenging these radicalized policies being ushered into our countries. Truth tellers who dare to expose the dangers of mass migration, violent jihad, left wing policies are now um, facing horrible tactics being deployed by the media and their leaders in the uh, left wing parties. These communist tactics, such as smears, threats, uh, threats to your livelihood, trying to bankrupt you, trying to destroy your life, targeting your children, targeting anybody in your life uh, who associates with you. Um, you are now being branded a Nazi, a racist, an Islamophobe, a xenophobe, simply for having a differing point of view. Uh, even more terrifying to me was the number of leaders that challenge Islam that are now being forced to live in safe houses. They're now being forced to live under police protection 24 hours a day simply for challenging Islam. My question, I guess, is um, can you name an instance where anybody has challenged Christianity or Judaism that now lives under the fear of death, that now has to live with security that now has to live in a safe house these the the things transpiring are absolutely terrifying to me the more i reported on europe the more i realized that europe was starting to resemble an islamic country living under sharia it was no longer the europe that i had known uh, my goal was to show america this and to wake us up so we could possibly take a different path. I didn't realize um, that by doing this, I would then become a target. I didn't realize that by me doing this in America that my family and my loved ones would now be one of the first cases where the hard left media would try to silence my voice by attacking my family, by attacking my loved ones, by attacking anybody who associated with me. I didn't realize that working on a grassroots level to uncover all of the assaults taking place in our freedoms across the world would now make my loved ones live in fear every day for their lives. I didn't realize that my family members' uh, ability to earn a living was going to be greatly, greatly impaired simply because I was educated on the Quran and would report on the anti-Semitic verses and hateful verses um, in the Quran. I, I, I didn't realize that I, as a Jewish woman, would now be labeled an alt-right white nationalist, white supremacist Nazi because I actually supported Donald or I, I supported then candidate Donald Trump for president of the United States. The media first turned their attention to me in 2015 when a lot of my work started to be retweeted by then candidate Donald Trump. Um, I was also featured in a New York Times article that was about the women who supported then candidate Donald Trump for president. Uh, he appealed to me because he was one of the first politicians in America who challenged the globalist agenda. He was one of the first presidents who so boldly spoke about putting our country first, America first. Um, he spoke honestly about the jihadi threat. He spoke about the importance of protecting America's borders, which somehow became controversial. Um, Donald Trump understood the importance of being a truth teller and speaking out and not mincing words and going after the enemies of the West boldly. At the time the New York Times article came out about me, I had been receiving a lot of credible threats because I covered the atrocities of ISIS and Islamic supremacy. Um, 
and just Islamic terrorism and terror tied groups across the world and specifically in the United States. So the more my work became influential, the more threats and the more negative media attention I started to receive. Interestingly, uh, some of the first real negative attention I received was from uh, hard left groups that use these deceptive names in the UK called Hope Not Hate or Resisting Hate or Tell Mama. They were vicious and um, they, they started to come after me and they were some of the first people who also were calling me a Russian bot. The mainstream media across America quickly caught on to this and started to call me again, a Russian bot, um, someone who was working for the Russian government, who was working for Vladimir Putin, whose only goal was to put out disinformation. So there were dozens and dozens of articles from European and American media um, calling me this foreign fabrication, uh, saying that I'm spreading disinformation. Um, somehow, I guess they couldn't understand how an American woman could be Jewish and could be conservative and could be a human rights activist, uh, somebody who is an animal activist. I have been a vegan since I'm 11 years old. I shoot guns. I am a pro Second Amendment advocate. I fight mass incarceration in America. I also started a non for profit that worked for the wrongfully imprisoned. And I'm a therapist. So I kind of broke all of the stereotypes, I guess, of who they felt would be a conservative and who they felt would be a Trump supporter. I broke all of their their stereotypes of what a conservative was supposed to be, of what a Trump supporter was supposed to be. And because I broke all of these stereotypes, um, they felt I needed to be destroyed and I needed to be discredited. It became very clear to me that they had reached a new level of hysteria when Jake Tapper, a very popular uh, CNN anchor, started to tell his audience um, on social media that I was a Russian bot. Uh, next thing I know, I got a call from somebody that there was a program going on in San Francisco in the United States on a major television network that was 30 minutes long that featured four reporters from different uh, mainstream media organizations discussing how I was a Russian bot and was working for Vladimir Putin and my account had to be fake and uh, I had to be discredited because there was no way someone like me actually existed. So in the summer of 2017 then, it was actually extremely terrifying to me when I found out my Twitter account where I was putting out so much research was banned in Germany and in France. And for me, um, this was shocking because there was another time in history that France and Germany silenced Jewish women and Jews in general. So to be banned for my reporting in France and Germany and be silenced uh, really felt like history was starting to repeat itself again. What I found the most interesting is that the mainstream media never uh, ever made an effort to address any of my work. They never uh, tried to refute the substance of my reporting. The, instead, they tried to make it personal and they tried to discredit everything about me in these bizarre and unfounded smears where I almost feel like they were trying to tempt me to reveal who I was and continue to make these outlandish statements with the hope that I would expose myself um, despite it being very obvious and me constantly publicizing the threats to my life I was facing. So in April 2018, um, the attacks kind of took this really terrifying turn when a counterterrorism reporter at NBC started to send me direct messages that um, he thinks he discovered my identity and he knows who I am and he started to uh, send me information about me and my husband and my family and uh, 
I, I just ignored these messages at first. I then, as he kept persistently coming after me, I begged him not to put my to my life at risk, not to put my family's life at risk, knowing and proving and showing these threats that I'm constantly facing. Um, you know, when people uh, tell me they're going to show up at my home to kill me or people post pictures of my house and um, my family members, this terrifies me. So I naively believed in a really human level that these leftist reporters working for major news organizations would not want to put my family's life at risk. I, I pleaded with this left-wing um, NBC news reporter who you would think would be interested in my work because he was a counterterrorism reporter and this was exactly what I was reporting on. Um, I asked him, please focus on my work, focus on my message. If you want to have a debate, if you want to talk about the substance of my work, I would love that. But um, that wasn't his interest. His interest was in trying to hurt me and trying to expose my identity. Um, then in 2018, of, uh, I'm sorry, then in May of 2018, I began receiving calls and emails from a reporter at the Huffington Post. Um, I couldn't understand how this man had my private email and I couldn't understand how he had my private phone number. Um, something felt really different. His tone was scary. His messages were aggressive. Uh, I, I felt uneasy about this man in particular, just something, something felt different. So next thing I know, this man starts um, sending emails to my husband's work. And he, he reached out to my husband and he claimed to him in this email that he knew who his wife was and that he was seeking a comment about me. And to give you a little understanding about my husband, um, his parents are legal immigrants who came to America with third grade educations. Um, they never took a handout in their life. They raised four amazing, successful men who uh, all have given back so much to society. My, my husband was living the American dream that every legal immigrant uh, strives for in our country. He, his parents worked seven days a week at factories. Um, they had a fruit stand. They were working to move their children out of one area and into the suburbs for a better school system, for a better life. My husband himself put himself through business school, college, law school. Uh, again, everything he was, everything he is, is self-made. So he's never somebody who involved himself at all in the political arena. He's somebody who's always gone to great lengths to keep his political views uh, silent. So even though my husband, who was never politically inclined and never got involved in politics, um, he became the one of the main targets for this reporter simply because of his proximity to me and not just this reporter but many reporters so after they contacted him at his work i subsequently learned that people in my personal life uh, from my own work from my own world were starting to be contacted people from my childhood were starting to be contacted anybody who was involved with me in any way this reporter was combing through my personal life trying to find anybody any way to make a comment about me um, as a social worker people come to me with their most vulnerable struggles in life they come to me with mental illnesses the reporter went so far as to contact people who are already dealing with trauma and who are already dealing with stress in their world and persistently hound them to make a statement about me the phone call that i got from one woman i'll never forget she was in tears she wouldn't leave her house 
She felt like he, she was being watched. She was on the phone crying to me that, are they gonna come after me? So uh, this reporter was doing an incredible job of instilling fear into anyone associated with me. What I did not realize at the time was that my home and my personal movements and those of my family members were all being watched. Um, I didn't realize that my private computer had been hacked either by this reporter or by people who were supplying him information. Things grew extremely terrifying when my husband was terminated from his very successful career. Prior to this, my husband had only received the greatest accolades at his work. Um, he was terminated from his job because of the repeated contacts by this reporter to his employer and by foreign influences. As much as I would love to divulge and go into the horrific specifics of what transpired with my husband, I can't given the legal considerations involved in all of this. But at this point, um, you have to understand that I had no idea what this reporter was going to write. I had no idea um, what he had said to my husband's employer. The article that he was writing about me had not even come out. So days after my husband's termination, I received more correspondence from this stalker. So this time he sent me 11 specific statements and asked me to comment on each of them. These statements were so outrageous and shocking, nothing more than a trap by this reporter to try to get me to divulge more personal information, um, which obviously he wasn't able to find out on his own and people he was trying to contact about me weren't giving him the, uh, the information I guess he was looking for. So I had never dealt with anything like this in my life before. I went, <clears throat> directly to the public via my social um, media and I informed them to what had just happened to my husband and uh, the threats and the stalking um, that we were receiving by this person. At the time, I did not realize that this same unethical so-called journalist who was targeting me, a private citizen, came from a long line of powerful and notorious operatives from the American Democratic Party. I did not know his family's connections. In fact, this reporter's grandfather was the former chair of the Democratic National Committee, and he happened to have run the campaign, uh, the presidential campaign for Lyndon B. Johnson. So his grandfather's obituary that was published in the New York Times actually emphasized this late operative's belief that elections are never won by taking the high road. So um, in addition, this Huffington Post reporter's father is currently a major Democrat lobbyist in America. It is not surprising to me either to learn that a Project Veritas reporter recently um, wrote that this specific Huffington Post reporter, um, his family has a long history of Nazi collaboration and support for Hitler. So that was um, very interesting for me to recently find out. But I have always refused to name this Huffington Post reporter um, name simply because that is what my stalker is craving. He wants attention. He is doing this for the purpose, I believe, of not only trying to harm me, but to somehow propel himself to left-wing fame. Following the release of my statement on social media, this Huffington Post reporter reached out to me pretty soon after, and again, the article has not yet been released, where he um, said, quote, you are undoubtedly a talented troll, which is why I am going to write about you, AKA destroy you. So that night, the hit piece by the Huffington Post was published, and I did not realize at the time that the Huffington Post was um, owned by Verizon Media, a telecommunications group or um, organization in America that now obviously supports the stalking and smearing and doxing of American citizen and her family for having 
uh, different views, let's say, than what their corporation supports. So this anti-Semitic reporter in the article actually sought out a statement about me by CARE, the Council of American Islamic Relations spokesperson, Ibrahim Hooper, who said that um, I was a, quote, major cog in the Islamophobia machine end of quote, CARE has actually been identified as an organization established by the U.S. Muslim Brotherhood's Palestinian Committee, which is Hamas in America. Hamas openly calls for the destruction of Israel and for Jews, so CARE has been um, receiving funds from other Hamas entities and organizations that are affiliated with Al-Qaeda. This, um, in this uh, article that now has been released uh, immediately went viral and was picked up from all different reporters and mainstream media outlets such as CNN, again, MSNBC, Vice, The Guardian, The New York Times, Yahoo, BuzzFeed, Politico, Daily Beast, The Associated Press, um, pretty much all the major left-wing uh, media organizations and ironically even Hollywood leftists had something to say and were promoting this hit piece against me and my family. This um, media pylon poisoned the first page now of Google results which pretty much branded me and my family members or falsely branded me and my family members as Nazis and as um, every terrible thing you could possibly imagine. This uh, article that now is going viral named the location of my parents' home. They um, named the location of my parents' business. They uh, even named where my brother's home and business were located. So within a few hours of this publication, uh, we started to receive threats to my parents' home. We started to um, see protests at my family's work and security had to be hired because, um, yeah, because <laughs> the pylon was crazy and now every single person who had been lodging threats against me for years, um, credible, horrible threats, uh, was now given the location on how to locate me, my name, and um, all of my family members' names um, down to their homes, down to where they could be found. So. This hit piece was so vile that um, jihadists, Antifa, Nazis were all starting to threaten us. I, I received thousands and thousands of threats. Um, also, my family's home started to receive phone calls. These are people who I, I, my, I don't even live with my family, but now they became the target. Um, these allegations were so egregious. They were so personal that um, I, I didn't know how to handle it. By defending myself publicly against these heinous crimes, it would be giving my stalkers and those trying to hurt me just more ammunition. Out of the 44,000 tweets at the time I had released on my social media platform, he cherry picked a few of them and presented them in a completely out of context manner. He said in this article that I called for the death of all Muslims instead of saying that I was targeting the ISIS terrorists who were slaughtering Christians in the Middle East. He made it as if I was literally calling for the death of Muslims, something that I would never do and don't in any way endorse. He claimed that I was some uneducated woman who had never worked in my life. Meanwhile, I hold two master's degrees from prestigious universities and my entire adult life I have worked. This anti-Semitic reporter took the charitable work that my husband and I have done for the wrongfully convicted and their families, for prison reform, for minorities, for animal rights, and he tried to vilify, pervert, and harm all the good work that we devoted our lives to doing. He labeled me as a, as a Nazi, as a white supremacist. Clearly, as I've discussed, I'm a Jewish woman. He boasted about having my husband fired. And <laughs> he went after my looks. 
He went after um, my, my physical appearance and mocked me. Uh, so again, these these childhood friends who I know for decades were being contacted for comments about me, were being harassed. Using the resources of the Huffington Post, he scoured every aspect of my life. There was not one part of my life that he did not try to violate or he did not try to shame or disrupt. This stalker even admitted in the article that he had people watching us. He had people watching our home. He went so far as to report on the dry cleaning that my husband had in the back seat of his car and the model of the, my, the, of the car that my husband drives. There was not a part of our life that he was not trying to hunt. This reporter's only named source was a woman who was struggling with substance abuse, who had actually tried to break into my family's home. He used an intruder to attribute completely fabricated vile statements about me. Once this article was published, certain media outlets were not satisfied. They began calling for my loved ones to literally denounce me, to disown me, to isolate me, to cut me off, to do anything that they could do to put the fear in them that if they would associate with me and not, uh, not denounce me, that they would be next, that they would come after them and smear them next. The hard left media followed rule 13 from socialist activist Saul Alinsky's book, Rules for Radicals, that said, quote, pick the target, freeze it, personalize it, and polarize it. Cut it off from the network and isolate the target from sympathy. Go after people and not institutions. People hurt faster than institutions, end of quote. If you were in any way associated with me, whether through a professional relationship, through a friendship, through a marriage, through blood, if you had anything to do with me, you were going to be held accountable for all of my thoughts, for all of my opinions, and for my reporting. As I mentioned before, before this his piece was even published, I put out a media, a social media statement about this reporter stalking me and pushing me to have my husband fired. The Huffington Post, the American Society of Journalists, and several other news agencies pumped out follow-up articles, claiming that my original statement angered people enough to lodge threats against the Huffington Post. People were furious that a reporter would actually dox and endanger an entire family. Now they were somehow trying to blame me for inciting threats against this reporter and the Huffington Post. The Southern um, Poverty Law Center, the SPLC, even included my organization, Rare Foundation USA, which had not yet been launched at the time in their quote, hate watch section. The SPLC is a prominent civil rights av um, advocacy organization in America, which has long been corrupted by the left. So the SPLC yields a lot of influence in America. And once you mo make this quote, hate group list, they um, they boycott you in America. American businesses won't do business with you. Um, you are banned from things like PayPal. You are banned from different um, tools to build a website. You are uh, banned from being basically able to operate as an um, as an organization. So keep in mind. All of this is happening, all of this outrage about this organization before uh, Rare was even launched at the time. So they didn't know what we were even about. Um, there was an outcry thankfully, of support and outrage by uh, patriots and grassroots bloggers across the world. Um, people were rightfully terrified that this was gonna happen to them next. And their families, like mine, were going to be in jeopardy. So most mainstream conservatives at the time, or uh, prominent mainstream conservatives, remained silent, which was perhaps the the worst aspect of this because instead of them giving their support and standing by me um i believe a lot of them cowered in fear because they didn't want to be next um they too were actually terrified of 
talking about things like Islam and Islamic extremism and terrorism out of fear of what would happen to them. Uh, look at look at what happened to Charlie Hebdo. Look at what happened um, just recently to Samuel Paddy in France, the teacher who was beheaded. They didn't want to be on the target list next. So while mainstream conservatives are, you know, concerned about being labeled as politically incorrect, the hard left is busy calling us white supremacists, calling us Nazis, fascists, and other horrific names, calling for terrible actions to be taken against us, while we still oftentimes, a lot of prominent conservatives stay silent with hopes that they won't be next. Sadly, the common person speaking out against evil is left standing alone. Um, and again, mainstream conservatives ignorantly believe that their silence is going to somehow protect them. Too often, conservatives are more interested in conserving themselves and their public reputations. They are not willing to put themselves out there on the line to stand shoulder to shoulder with other activists and journalists like myself trying to stand up for our freedoms and for our rights. Um, this mentality has continued to destroy us. And not only are we left standing alone, but oftentimes they join in the smear tactics um, and feel staying silent is better. We're at war with a toxic ideology and we cannot remain worried just about ourselves. If we don't start forming coalitions amongst ourselves and standing together for free speech and for our individual freedoms, we're gonna lose this war. The leftists like to pretend that they believe in the concept of a strong and independent woman, a woman who has her own passions and who has her own thoughts, who is, um, you know, who they deem the, the, the feminist, yet, all of these left-wing media outlets targeted my husband, my father, my brother, just for my thoughts and my opinions. Now they push the, the notion that I am somehow an extension of the thoughts of these three men. And because these three men are somehow associated with me, they should be punished for not keeping me in line, for not silencing me, for not allowing me to know my place. So the irony is my father is apolitical, my brother is a liberal, and my husband disagrees with most of my politics, as I said. So I am not somehow a reflection of them. I'm a reflection of myself, a reflection of a strong and independent woman and a conservative feminist. And this has somehow threatened them to the enough that since these men couldn't keep me silenced, they now have to. The left wants to tell you they are for LGBTQ rights. They, yet they are the people who are turning a blind eye every day to the atrocities occurring under Sharia. They claim to be champions of animal rights, yet they embrace halal, one of the most barbaric and inhumane ways for an animal to die. They claim to care about women's rights, but they fight against laws that are literally banning female genital mutilation. They claim to care about issues such as child trafficking and slavery, yet look at how they've turned a blind eye to the UK grooming gang epidemic. They are the people who are bringing these migrants into the countries that are harming these children. The left claims to care about our prison system, yet they are the ones who are fostering the prison industrial complex. Again, I am the one speaking out against anti-Semitism. I'm the one trying to promote LGBTQ rights. I'm the one trying to promote animal rights, to care about women's rights, to fight against child trafficking, to fight against the industrial prison system, to help wrongful convictions, to help prison reform, to stand up for animal rights. I'm a vegan. My life has been dedicated to helping those who are less fortunate than myself and trying to shine a spotlight on the atrocities taking place and any injustice across the world. 
Keep in mind, I am not someone who is getting paid for my work. I am not someone who is being funded by anybody. I am somebody who's been doing all of my investigative reporting on my own. I was just actually a test run for the radical left. They wanted to use me as an example to show you, to make each of you scared, that if you make too much of a difference, you too will be destroyed. And not only will they come for you, but they will also now come for your families and they will successfully be able to come for your families. This Huffington Post reporter, like so many other so-called journalists, are the modern day brown shirts. The message is clear. If you dissent from the leftist agenda, if you dare oppose jihad terror, or stand for the equality of rights of all people against Sharia oppression, they too will destroy you. Today in America, the left has become so emboldened that now very high level democratic leaders and their media are actually publishing hit lists of anybody who is a Trump supporter and who is a Trump official. They will put your name on a list, they will dox you, and they will call for you to be destroyed and to never be hired in America again. This public shaming is reminiscent of Mao's cultural revolution and the tactics used in Nazi Germany. These leftists will stand for absolutely no more dissent than Hitler or Stalin did. If the Huffington Post was actually able to convince people in the public that I, a Jewish woman, is somehow a Nazi, then they are literally capable of branding anybody, anything they want, and discrediting you in every possible way. These leftists will not stand for any dissent any more than Hitler or Stalin did. If this Huffington Post reporter was actually able to convince you that a Jewish woman who champions Jewish causes is a Nazi, then that means they are winning and that means they are actually able to destroy and smear anybody. I grew up predominantly around Jewish people who, like my family, had been in some way impacted by the Holocaust. I grew up seeing people's numbers tattooed on their arm as a little girl. So from a young age, I could not wrap my head around how something so evil like the Holocaust could happen, um, how millions of people could be slaughtered. So my mom always would teach me as a little girl that if you see evil, you have a personal responsibility to call it out loudly, to identify it and to certainly not be silent, to not hide from it, to um, be bold. So um, I, I never understood how so many people in our world today could not learn from history and could remain silent as we're seeing so many atrocities take place. Um, you know, uh, people thought that the they somehow remain silent during the Holocaust, that they too would be spared, that somehow their life would not be taken. Um, it sent chills down my spine when I heard the recordings of the hijackers on the 9-11 uh, plane, the, the terrorists literally saying uh, to all of the passengers over the loudspeaker, calm down, stay silent, everything would be okay. The one thing history has shown us over and over and over again is if you stay silent, it's not gonna be okay. Um, the only hijacked plane that did not hit its target on 9-11 was the one where the passengers did not stay silent and instead they overthrew the terrorists. They rose up. We're, such, we're at such a pivotal time in our history right now where we're watching the evils from the past um, in our history start to take place again. And um, speaking from personal experience, I can tell you that the opposition is absolutely vicious. They will go to any means, by any means necessary, to destroy you and to destroy your family. And it's getting more terrifying every day. And if we're going to win, we cannot stay silent. We have to raise our voices. And it's the responsibility of every single freedom-loving person um, and moral person to 
call out evil, we cannot allow them to intimidate us into submission. Uh, to all of those who are watching today and who are standing with Anne-Marie and the Four Britain Party, I know the personal risk that each of you are facing. Um, I'm inspired by all of you. I continue to fight because of people like you, because you're brave, because you've refused to back down. And um, your courage gives me courage. So I thank each of you for giving me the opportunity to talk about my story and to talk about some of my experiences. And I hope you heed my warning. Um, it's been so incredible and such an honor to know people like Amory Waters who have given me the strength to keep on fighting. As I said, when I opened this, she is a personal hero of mine and um, the UK is lucky to have her. And, um, you know, God bless each of you. Thank you for what you're doing. Um, and. God bless the UK and God bless America. Thank you. This dog-loving, petite little lady has been called a fascist, a racist, Islamophobic, far-right. Well, according to the mainstream media, if you believe them, she's been called all that and more. She formed and is the leader of a political party. But just who is she? I was born in Dublin. Uh, I grew up in central Dublin. I've always been a city centre girl. I've always lived in big cities uh, until I moved to Essex a few years ago. Um, grew up in uh, north Dublin, central Dublin, uh, working class, um, sprawling working class, north central Dublin. Um, moved out to the suburbs when I was about nine years old um, and I left uh, in my late teens. I lived in Amsterdam for a couple of years, lived in Germany for a while uh, and then after Amsterdam I decided that I needed to get serious, do something with my life. Um, I, I'm glad, very glad I experienced the, the university thing and I'm glad I experienced it actually before it became what it is today because back then it wasn't like that. It really wasn't. You were able to speak freely back then, or at least what I thought was free. It's certainly a lot freer than you can now. Mm. Um, there was a PC that you could sort of see PC coming into it, but it was nothing like it is today. Well, I know you're a friend of Anne-Marie. What is your name? Khadija Adam. Can you please explain why we have to hide your face in this film? Uh, well, firstly, as you can see, I'm obviously quite ugly. <laughs> No, not really. Um, well, as you can see, I'm of Pakistani heritage um, and an ex-Muslim and I just simply don't feel safe showing my face due to the th threat of violence and persecution, not only from the Pakistani Muslim community, but also from the left. Um, the left push an agenda of hate and intimidation and I simply just don't fit their narrative and therefore I'm a prime target for them, so I don't want to show my face.
One of the great things about the Forbidden Annual Conference is that we get to hear people speaking about issues which are very important, but which sadly are neglected elsewhere across the political spectrum. And of course, one of the big issues that really we're not allowed to talk about is the impact of Islam here in the United Kingdom. So I'm very pleased to be able to introduce to you Hugo Jenks, the author of a very interesting book called Hellish 2050, which explores exactly where this United Kingdom is going with regard to the growth of Islam within it. So please welcome Hugo. Hello, we need to discuss Islam, Islam itself. We need to be free to discuss Islam. All too often we are penalized if we do so. Supposedly we have free speech in the UK. Unfortunately, I also know to my own cost that freedom comes at a price. You may lose your job if you speak out. Let's look at the time scales involved. I am here at Stanton Drew, which is an ancient stone circle in Somerset. It is some 4,500 years old. Islam is around 14 centuries, so in comparison, it is a stroppy teenager. But in the context of other events, for example, the abolition of slavery is not quite two centuries, and it was abolished in Christian countries of the West. No Islamic country, as far as I'm aware, has voluntarily abolished slavery. And we need to think of modern concepts of rights and truthfulness and dignity. In the UK, we are told, oh, the intolerant, violent Muslims are only a tiny percentage. Maybe those who take action directly are a minority. However, let's look at some statistics, some data collected from opinion polls. Two-thirds of British Muslims would not report a terrorist. That is from an ICM poll of 2016. 52% say homosexuality should be banned. 35% of young Muslims in Britain believe suicide bombings are justified. 62% of British Muslims say freedom of speech should not be protected. And this is what we're up against. I have done some calculations and it seems highly probable that at some point in this century the demographics will be such that Islam will dominate the UK and dominate many Western countries. And we don't have much time to turn this around. The point at which there is a Muslim majority is largely irrelevant because by that point it will be impossible to reverse. So we need to look at the point of no return. I had a look at the data for all of the countries in the world and there is almost a dead band and a point at which you cannot have a stable population when the Muslim percentage is above 22%. Between 22% and 50%, there are only a handful of countries in the world which have that percentage. The UK, we don't know exactly the Muslim percentage here in 2020. Next year, hopefully, there will be a census and we shall find out the official data. Of course, we take that with a pinch of salt. So demographics, that is the problem that we're facing. Truthfulness. Truthfulness is on our side. Within a predominantly Christian culture, whether you are a churchgoer or not, we do have the idea that we must speak the truth. There are the Ten Commandments. Do not bear false witness. I've searched through Islamic scripture and I cannot find any equivalent. Indeed, there are several types of deceit that are permitted within Islam, and you can look those up. We must persevere. Our parents' and grandparents' generation fought for our liberties, and we must pass on those liberties to the younger generation. We have no right to throw it away. Every pillar of society is failing. The judiciary, the military, the church, politics in general. 
I have been in contact with around 100 Conservatives, those whose names are within the Muslim Council of Britain dossier on Islamophobia within the Conservative Party. Mostly they don't answer my emails. Those that do, three of them have left or been expelled from the Conservative Party for expressing a negative opinion about Islam. But their comments are on were social media or elsewhere, and as far as I can see, most of those comments were truthful. Truthful about the reality of Islam. The current leader of the Conservative Party is effectively an apologist for Islam. He once knew what Islam was about, following the London bombings of 7-7-2005, he appeared on a Question Time programme, and unfortunately I can't find the recording, but I do remember he made a half-hearted attempt at quoting from the Quran, and it was one of the verses which promotes hostility to non-Muslims, one of the many verses. As he was trying to speak this verse, also on the panel there was a female Muslim comedian and she spoke all over his description of the problem and he also wrote a, a article in the spectator and basically at that point 2005 he understood what the problem was with islam i do believe he understood it then he became mayor of london and in 2013 fusilier lee rigby was murdered on the streets of woolwich by two converts to islam and one of those murderers was captured on video describing exactly why he did it. And he used Islamic scripture to justify what he did. Unfortunately, even then, 2013, the mainstream politicians did not listen. Indeed, Boris Johnson himself said that the attack was nothing to do with Islam. And you can see that video. So what happened to him between 2005 and 2013? I don't know, but somebody evidently has managed to persuade him to speak dishonestly. And where does this dishonesty come from? If you remember back to 2001, 9-11, the 11th of September, the attacks in America where nearly 3,000 people were murdered. At that point, the dishonesty was already apparent. The dishonesty by mainstream politicians of left or right, it seems immaterial, they would make a distinction between moderate Islam and radical Islam. However, if you read the Quran, if you examine Islam, you come to realize that there cannot be any such thing as moderate Islam. The verses in the Quran, which are intolerant, hate-filled, demanding violence, they are the more recently revealed verses, and where there are contradictions, the earlier revealed verses are effectively cancelled out, abrogated by the intolerant. This is the reality. This is the reality that mainstream politicians will never admit. Of the hundred or so conservatives who I attempt to contact, three replied saying that they were no longer in the Conservative Party because they stood their ground. They would not be cowed. They would not give in to deceit. And how is it that in the Conservative Party an opinion poll has shown that some 61% of party members have a dim view of Islam? 61%. They must be persuaded somehow to say, this is not good enough. We cannot have members being expelled for exposing the truth. I asked those three a question. Do you think that Conservative Party members have a fairly good un understanding of Islam? Or do you think that they're ignorant? The answer is, they have a fairly good understanding, but they do not want to speak out. I know history does not exactly repeat, but there are certain parallels to be seen with 1930s Germany, where it was the conservative politicians in Germany who enabled the totalitarian regime to develop. And we see today conservative politicians, mainstream politicians, will not speak out. They are enabling totalitarian Islam in the UK. In Germany, they had the vain idea that they would allow the Nazi party to take prominent positions, 
but then they thought they could control it later on. That is madness. And we saw a similar thing with the Islamic Revolution in Iran. The secular politicians thought they could control the radical. No, not possible. At this current time, it is quite hard to feel positive. It's quite hard to see a future. It's quite hard to keep going. But tell me, what else would you do? Finally, on a positive note, we must believe that we can do this. Truthfulness, decency, good morals, freedoms, these are all on our side. Islam has none of these. Thank you. I don't know about you, but when I hear so many talking heads on the TV and radio uh, going on about environmental matters, the thing that always impresses me is how little they know. So I would like to contrast that with our next guest speaker, Paul Burgess, who is an authority and an expert on environmental concerns. And I'm sure you'll really enjoy what he has to say to you. So Paul, you made a video about this so-called environmental group, Extinction Rebellion. Mm -hmm. Tell us about them. Tell us what they stand for. Um, well, basically, um, they're, a extreme, they're a communist organisation run by the extreme left wing. Mm. Uh, and they're claiming that we've only got now 10 years before it's irreversible, mass extinction of the humans, etc. Which no one agrees with. I mean, no, the IPCC, who I oppose, even they, that's the, you know, the um, UN climate people. Mm. They totally disagree with that. And um, so and the, the extremes to which they go to, to impose their, their agenda, which would completely finish life as we know it. I mean, let's get it straight. What they're asking for is to go to zero within five years, um, CO2 emissions. Zero emissions. That would be, zero CO2 emissions would mean not life as we know it. No mm -hmm. cars, no planes. The lot, nothing. And in the interview, the video I did was um, a, a, an interview with Andrew Neil, which I analysed and gave the facts behind. And uh, as Andrew himself pointed out, Andrew Neil, you're only talking about 0.01% or something if you stop the flying. And of course, what really is most annoying is the whole of the UK, for example, only, only puts out 1.25, 1.3%, say, of the world's CO2. And if we stopped as a country to exist, it wouldn't make that much difference because that 1.2%, 1.3% is made up within the year elsewhere. So, and the CO2 is climbing all the time because of the Far East, China and India mainly, but yeah. generally. So why concentrate on the 1% and leave the 99%, which somehow, be, well, that's because they're communists, you see, so they can carry on. So CO2 molecule obviously change, is political. It changes its nature. It's benign if it comes from a communist country. Right. <laughs> right? Well, it is. Or, or if it comes from a Western country, it's, it's terrible, I right? See. And um, so th 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 they're extreme and they actually disrupt people. I mean, uh, there's a video actually, uh, uh, I'll, I'll show it now. There's a little video of them holding up an ambulance with blue lights um, just last week in Britain. And this ambulance is trying to get through their roadblocks and it's, and it's struggling. And they have no right to do that. Um, but for some reason, and um, for some reason, the police and everyone cooperate with this law breaking. I think now it's beginning to turn, the tide's beginning to turn. But the interesting thing is on the video I made with their spokeswoman, she has now left Extinction Rebellion and she is actually um, pr um, heading for uh, nuclear. She's supporting nuclear power. Uh, and so she's, gone, she's actually seen the light a bit. Mm. But it is um, an extremist organisation. It's led by ignorant people and, and the people who follow it. I'm sorry, they're ignorant because they don't know the climate change facts. What they'll tell you is certain scientists, or so-called scientists like Dr. Mann, will actually say, oh yes, you know, there's a problem. But that's, the science is not saying that. So uh, it's just an example. There's really no difference almost between Extinction Rebellion, Black Lives Matter, all of them. Uh, um, because they're all communist-founded 
things which are only interested in taking down the West. And, and as a matter of interest, uh, the UK has not actually reduced its CO2. All it's done is export it. And, and by giving the manufacturing over to China, the only difference is we have more pollution now. Where we have higher standards on pollution, they have lower standards, we all know, on the pollution. I mean, the Yellow River is really the Yellow River, and um, it turns yellow. And the, um, th that is, that's incredible because and there are research papers published on this. And if you actually calculate the extra CO2, well, all we've done is produce more of it. We haven't saved anything, but we have exported jobs. We've exported the jobs very, very well to do that. And our government's target now of zero emissions by 2050 and so on um, are just unbelievable. Um, they, they, they can't happen. And um, I, I mean, I'll be coming up with a solution for all this. But basically, um, the, um, um, how can I put it? Um, there's no problem, can I first of all say, there's no problem with more CO2, we need more CO2. I mean, I know it's not on the news, but this year we've had record harvests throughout the world. The corn harvest and so on, they're all record harvests because the extra CO2 has, has done the equivalent of greening an area twice the size of the USA. Um, so the extra growth we're getting from this CO2, and it's not me saying this, it's a NASA paper saying this, but 70% of the growth from, of the extra growth in the world, which is enormous, Deserts are being encroached, encroached upon by vegetation because as you increase the CO2, the plants need less water. And, and so you've got that sort of situation. Now, to get back to uh, Extinction Rebellion, they're now doing a revival sort of thing at the moment in Britain. And I, I think that government are, are beginning to clamp down. A bit late though, uh, and I don't think they should be allowed at all to disrupt traffic and so on. I don't think anyone should. No. I, I think we all have the right to peaceful protest, and the word is peaceful. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and by the way, in the Constitution of the USA, it's the word is peaceful. I know it's not going on, <laughs> but the word is peaceful. And everyone has a right, and I don't mind these anarchic, the ignorant lunatics as far as I'm concerned. And most people recognise that. But the message out there is their message is, is not technically right. They simply have got the science wrong, and and it isn't just me that's saying that. It's the the whole almost everyone's saying that. So let's talk a little bit of it. You said that it's, it's it's essentially the same as Black Lives Matter. These are all communist groups yes. exploiting one issue or another. Correct. To my mind, the the climate change alarmists, as you call them, mm. are exploiting pollution and genuine concern for our environment. There mm -hmm. are genuine concerns well, are. for our environment. Can you take us through what the, what genuine concerns are and what the rubbish is? Let's, right. okay, let's, fine. See, let's get to the, the basics of it. Uh, yeah. Okay, now I'm very keen on pollution, or I'm, I'm controlling pollution. Mm -hmm. So um, people mix up pollution with climate yeah. change and, and they're totally distinct. I mean, the climate change movement has actually increased pollution. Yeah. And it really has, uh, 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 and because they, and they mix the two things up. So if you take, let's take two subjects, let's take first clean air in cities. Now, if you look at the agenda now of the government and the climate change lobby, mm -hmm. the agenda is to do away with all um, diesel and um, petrol cars and actually do away with, with even cars that are, you know, the combo of electric and things only go for pure electric. Now, let me tell you now, I, I, now I'm pretty old and it'll happen in my lifetime still, I think. That is an absolute rubbish. There's, there aren't enough resources in the world for the batteries to do that. If Britain changed all its light vehicles, that's light vans and cars, over to pure electric, we'd consume the whole of the world's stuff, more than that. And, and they couldn't increase it fast enough. And you can't say, oh, the market will react. There really are big issues with that. Even to put in an all-electric charging system, you're looking maybe at £180 billion to increase the um, distribution system. And you'd have every road dug up, you'd have every front garden dug up, because we haven't got enough capacity for the fast charging that's needed. So that's their agenda. So let's take a look at some of the truly absurd Prime Minister's proposals. They really are quite ridiculous, but we'll just take just a few of them. Boris just invents figures out the air. He claims we're going to install 600,000 heat pumps in the next eight years. And the typical cost is between 10 and 20,000 pounds each. That's costing between 60 and 100 billion pounds a year. Where is the money coming from? And then with wind farms, which are going to generate no power when the wind doesn't blow enough. 
These are going to cost an absolute fortune. The cost is about 120 to 130 billion. That is incredible. And you know where that money is going to go? It's going to go to overseas jobs. So Boris is right in one respect. It does create jobs, but it won't be creating them in the UK. But what his plans will do is enormously increase electricity prices, which are going to absolutely skyrocket because of these proposals. And that burden is harder on the shoulders of the poor. One does wonder who is advising the Prime Minister. Because these proposals are incredibly childish. They're totally impracticable and are political suicide. And as Nigel Lawson pointed out recently, Boris is economically illiterate because you might as well, to create jobs, erect statues of Boris Johnson in every town and square. But whilst creating jobs, it doesn't do anything useful for anybody. And that is exactly the same with his green energy policy. Which is going to cause all sorts of disruption, all sorts of building work. There is a sensible way out of that. If we take the electric cars and now the pollution of air. I'm keen on pollution, uh, uh, re improving the quality of air in big cities as well as small towns. Here's the, here's the proposal. And, and this is the party's proposal. Um, I hope it's the party's proposal. <laughs> uh, is we actually go for an, a sensible agenda which is this, have develop cars that have electric batteries big enough to just do 30 or 40 miles. That's all. You can charge these at home on an ordinary 13 amp socket. So you come home and you can plug it in. You don't need the extra 1,000 pound charging unit. You don't need cables running to your house. You don't need the substation to be bigger, the generating power to be bigger. You can do that. And in effect, you're also, uh, to some extent, using the nighttime power and balancing out the grid. So that's, that is a low resource thing. So what does that do? Well, most journeys are less than that. Most journeys are less than 30 or 40 miles. So when you go shopping, you're shopping on electric. So when you go into your little town, like I live near a little town, I'm going in, I'm going on electric, there's no, I'm reducing the air pollution in that little town. If I go into London, and as you can have it, you can bleed up to a trigger that as you enter, you've got to be electric as you pass a certain point and you come out, you know, and a 30 to 40 mile range will do it. But you do have charging from the car. So if you now go on a bigger journey, 100 miles, your, your, your engine will charge your battery. So you come back with it fully charged. So it isn't a pure solution. It isn't this marvellous thing the government has of everyone being on electric, which is totally impossible, mm. by the way. Um, and I've done a video on that, so uh, uh, people can watch in my um, Climate Realism series, which have explained the whole agenda we need for a sensible pollution. So there we are, by taking a sensible path, we first of all reduce the costs enormously. We make it viable for the ordinary consumer, because electric cars are very expensive. So we make it viable for the ordinary consumer. We still keep diesel and, 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 and petrol, but, but we control them. So a lot of the journeys into towns are clean, much cleaner air. There's the result. It's practical, it's pragmatic, okay. it works. Uh, and, and so that's one element of, of, of reducing pollution. Um, the other element, um, there's a number of elements, the number, another, another element is you're not reducing pollution by solar. If you take solar power and you take the waste um, from solar, there's no way of dealing with it. And I think people don't realise this, but when you put a solar panel up on your roof, for the first two years with the rain, the rain washes off a lot of carcinogenic materials uh, and the really bad materials are washed out. But when you're finished, when it's 20, 25 year lifespan is finished, you've now got a waste problem and there's no way of properly recycling them. That's right. The manufacture of solar panels produces a large quantity of toxic waste. In fact, what is needed to build solar panels is very high quality coal which has to be used in great quantities to produce solar panels. Per unit of energy output, solar panels produce 300 times more toxic waste than nuclear power. Now take an area the size of a football pitch. We're going to stack the waste on that area from nuclear um, and from solar for the same amount of energy. And as a basis, we're going to take the 2016 world production of nuclear power so in 25 years, how much waste would there be to what height over that football field from nuclear? And it's pretty high. It's the size of the Leaning Tower of Pisa. So how high would the waste be if it was from solar um, in that 25-year period? Well, for the same amount of energy, 
It would not be as high as Mount Everest, it'd be twice as high. That is almost twice the height that you fly out on those jets when on holiday. And the same for wind, wind, wind rains. Wind farms are terribly destructive. Um, a huge amount of concrete goes into the bases, mm. and I've done a video on that in the Climate Realism series, showing you how big the hole is they make. And they, and they have to haul this concrete and this aggregate across the country. And of course, uh, don't forget, concrete is made up of fossils. The stones, which is mainly limestone, is from fossils. And, and so what we're doing is releasing an awful lot of CO2, which actually is good, but never mind. But we're doing a lot of polluting to build these things. And then we find out, OK, they don't last that long. The 25 year plant life, no, nope, you maybe get 12 years because the blades are traveling up to 180 kilometers an hour and they're, they're hitting sorts of things in the air and they didn't allow for this. And, and the leading edge, once it goes on an aeroplane, same as on an aeroplane, once it goes, your aerodynamics go and the efficiency drops tremendously. So you've now got a waste problem. And what they're doing is opening up huge areas and burying them, the, the, the veins. And the cost has increased tremendously. Without huge subsidies, don't fall for the absolute lies by, by the mainstream media that say wind, wind and green energy will be cheaper. It isn't. Without the subsidies, it doesn't exist. Germany has maybe led Europe in it, in green. And it's now had to stop the subsidies on, on solar and it stopped the subsidies on solar and, and that's given two years notice because they all had 20 year contracts. So everyone's solar on the roofs, no feedback tariff. They don't want it, they said, because this green energy, they call it green from solar and wind, doesn't come when you need it. It comes when you don't need it. And there isn't a proper storage system. California um, has now got blackouts and it's saying to millions of people, I know there's a heat wave on, but don't put your aircon on. Because, and by the way, we're going to cut you off anyway now. So we're going to cut off a couple of million people tonight because we haven't got enough energy. And then, and then they, the madness goes further. They then say, oh, we're going to buy battery banks. Well, and this, and eight, eight billion pounds worth of battery banks. This is so expensive, it's beyond belief. It's the most expensive electricity in America. But the eight billion pounds is more than the world can supply in batteries. Just to the one state. Yes. And that is not the answer. There is an answer to that. I'll come on to that now. Uh, people have always worried about nuclear power, and understandably so. But let me tell you this, the, the British nuclear power authorities actually said when they were building Chernobyl, don't do it, it's dangerous. We wouldn't dream of building that in Britain. And look what happened. Mm -hmm. And they actually said to Japan, when they were building theirs, there were the tsunami problem, yeah. they said, don't build it there because it's subject to tsunamis. And Japan came back and said, no, 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 we're building a high wall. They said, you should never do it building nuclear power so you have to do mitigation. You avoid the mitigation, right. you put it higher, you just avoid the mitigation. Yeah. Yeah. And they didn't listen, right? So the British authorities here were dead on and, and you know, did it before the disasters. And, and so, but what nuclear does produce, the problem with nuclear is waste. And there's two problems. One is the potential for an accident, which people worry about, even though it's very, very low. And the second is waste. And the two types of waste, one is lasts about 300 years. Now you can cope with that because mm -hmm. after 300 years, there's no problem at all. You can yeah. have it in your back garden. What um, the other type is, uh, the plutonium, that's 100,000 years. And so you've got to somehow manage 100,000 years of waste before it becomes safe. That's a huge problem and it costs a fortune. Now, there's a solution and the solution is called the um, stable salt water reactor. Now, it sounds bad, it's nuclear. What this does is it takes that waste and it does away with the problem of the 100,000 year waste. The only waste it produces is the less than 300 year waste and smaller amount. So now you've got a waste problem and the fuel for this new system is the waste. That's the fuel. So, and we've got enough in Britain to do the next 400 years of the current capacity of production of electricity, we've got enough for 400 years. So we take waste, we make it much safer, and we get basically free electricity. In fact, the people who are looking after that waste will pay us to take it. Yes, because it relieves their cost. Mm -hmm. So it relieves a huge problem. We have no of the plutonium. And this new, this new reactor is based on something that happened two billion years ago on Earth because there were nuclear reactors on Earth two billion years ago. And in the land continent, because it moved around a bit, the continents, but the land part we know now is Africa, has got seven areas where when it rained in those areas, a nuclear reaction started. And when the rain stopped, it stopped. And this gave the idea for quite a lot of research in the 80s. And President Reagan um, 
in the 80s put 100 million dollars a year into research that was all dropped in the 90s because nuclear became bad because politicians don't understand science yeah. they don't understand technology uh, and they stopped it but the, the, a lot of development went on the people in the industry knew that and developed it further so now with something like the stable salt water reactor it's incredible because it can't melt down it, it, it just if you turn off the cooling it's like Chernobyl it just goes stops it's a safe nuclear reactor and, and it's so safe you can actually manufacture these units in factories and, li and the license to do this is just being granted in the USA now here's a chance for Britain to have and you can have small ones you can actually take one of these and put it in a coal power station because coal power station will have the coal production the heat and it'll have a steam part to generate the tur move the turbine and all you do is replace the coal part with one of these small units and you've now got a safe system running you know and you can just do it and we could replace all our energy with this and on top of that it reacts fast now at the moment nuclear is a stable thing you don't want to change it and coal is a stable thing you don't want to change it and we use gas to do the fluctuations this can do all this can do the fluctuations and this can produce you can do also you can in spare, in spare electricity you can start to store it in big heat vessels and all sorts of things but and it, as it happens, a disadvantage, but it doesn't produce any CO2 in this process. And the whole process is, is minimal as regards the impact on the environment in terms of building and everything else. So this um, stable salt water reactor, if Britain took hold of this, imagine it, we'd have cheap fuel. It, it, it's, it's, it's the lowest cost fuel. It's safe. It uses up waste and makes our world safer. And we could have practically unlimited energy, right? And on top of that, if we export it, it, it people can't easily, well, they can't um, use it to manufacture the stuff for bombs, for nuclear bombs. So we can export it, manufacture, and you can actually carry these units on the back of a low, low loader. You can actually carry them around the country, um, you know, and build them. And this is actually happening. Rolls-Royce and I think it's British Aerospace are combining together to start to build small nuclear. This is the future. Now, here's an opportunity, and I'm mentioning it now, for Britain to grab hold of this, become the experts on it, mm -hmm. export it all over the world and have a totally clean, pollution-free, relative pollution-free anything, is some pollution, but I mean hugely low pollution uh, footprint and marvellous amount of energy that's on tap. That creates an economy that just explodes. Creates and that's jobs, creates everything. It creates exports. everything. Uh, and where you've got expensive electricity like Germany, they're now suffering. Germany has brownouts. Germany can't maintain its production. And it, forget all the experts in the world. Anyone watching this, forget the experts. Anyone watching this, just think about this. It, you, if you only have energy when the wind blows or when the sun shines, it's meaningless because it's not when you need it. And I mean, it's only dawned on people that at night time the sun doesn't shine. And, and the peak time, by the way, is like between five o'clock and seven o'clock at night. It's a big, big lower, maybe up to eight o'clock. And that's the time when the sun isn't shining. Worse than that, by the way, and it is a mere game, scientific research has shown that above a certain latitude, solar panels, for example, never ever repay their CO2 debt. So they actually increase CO2. So German solar panels, UK, it works in the equator. It actually will repay, works either side of the equator. They'll repay their CO2 debt. But if the objective was to reduce CO2, if that was the objective, they've done the exact opposite. They've increased CO2. And the other thing is, CO2 is increasing all the time, totally regardless of Kyoto, or Paris, any of these. It makes no difference at all. The graph is just like this, right? And they don't even show a dent where they have the Paris summit. So all those are meaningless, just meaningless things. Because there's over 100 coal power stations being built in China. And, 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 and developing countries say, why can't we have coal? It's cheap. We can say, actually, you don't have to have coal. We can give you nuclear power plants that are safe, that can't melt down, and, and so on. They're safe in so many ways. And, and we, we, can, we, we can do this for you, and you can have clean, good, cheap energy. And there is a solution. I hope the UK grabs it. And, and um, anyway, for Britain's going to promote this. Yeah. Uh, uh, and we are putting a solution forward which reduces pollution uh, in terms of our, our policy on electric vehicles. Which, which is to have the hybrids mm -hmm. uh, and the hybrids with you know 30 or 40 miles range and the rest is that because that's practical yeah. it'll work mm -hmm. and I, I can't go into detail now but if people watch the series of videos it explains more <coughs> uh, and, um, and then we have two cities we have
people can afford it, we have cheap energy. It's been my pleasure for the past couple of years to introduce our next speaker to you. He is, of course, Mike Speakman. He is a retired former uh, Deputy Chief Constable, and he is the For Britain Party spokesman on that most important uh, issue of all, law and order. Please welcome Mike. One of the many disturbing developments in the last year has been the evidence emerging of a police force subverted to the aims of the left. The process has been underway for some time, but it is now publicly obvious and the police do not try to hide it. There have been some very disturbing videos of the way the police have behaved at some of the anti-lockdown gatherings in London, where, to be honest, they have become thugs in some cases pushing people to the ground and kicking them. They had behaved in a manner that was unthinkable even five years ago, and they seem to be unaccountable for this behaviour. Indeed, there is some sense in which it seems to be a deliberate tactic which is widespread across different police forces and seen sanctioned by those in authority. Contrast this behaviour to their kid glove treatment if not actual active cooperation with Black Lives Matter, Extinction Rebellion or anything to do with Islam and more recently Nigerian protests about Nigeria. In every case these events broke social distancing rules yet no action was taken. How can it be that social distancing breaches were the excuse for breaking up anti-lockdown gatherings? We have truly have dual standards of policing in this country. Even in Wales, legitimate protest was prevented at Penali Camp and people blocked from attending. Yet Antifa and Stand Up to Racism activists were positively assisted by the police. The police have become increasingly subject to political direction and left-wing ideology. I believe the process has been underway since at least the 1980s when the Tory party made a failed attempt to seize control of the police by creating police boards in the style of what we have now in the NHS. These boards are packed with cronies and party stalwarts who are biddable by their party masters. The Tories failed partly because the police thwarted their plans in Parliament with some very successful lobbying. But the Tories never gave up. I believe the McPherson report branding the police as institutionally racist was part of their plan to undermine the police. And I also believe it was a tactic of theirs to cut police numbers by 20,000 officers to make forces seem ineffective and pave the way for them to reform the police to suit their own agenda. Historically, the police were accountable to a police authority in each police force area. This authority usually made up of about 12 to 15 members, was consisted of politicians from all the local authorities in proportion to their party numbers, plus a number of magistrates. They were politically balanced and no single politician could have their way. The system was largely low key and partly or rarely became controversial. And that is probably the best way to hold the police to account. Now, we have police and crime commissioners. All the power, including the ability to sack the chief constable, now rests in the hands of one person, who might also be a city or regional mayor. The creation of these posts has sidelined the role of the chief constable. In my day, chiefs were noted for their fierce independence, and they trod a fine line between keeping politicians at arm's length whilst remaining accountable to their authority. The chiefs also had the support of their professional police body, the Association of Chief Police Officers, ACPO as it was known. I was a member of that body, but guess what? The government abolished it in 2015 and replaced it with a quango, the National Police Chiefs Council. This council is a puppet of government and follows the government agenda. This is not an agenda based on law enforcement and crime prevention. 
The police also had a national training system managed by police officers and was responsible for devising all training from recruits up to senior ranks. This too has been abolished and replaced with a College of Policing, which is actually a registered a limited company. This is the body which has decreed that all police recruits should be graduates and promotes the hate crime agenda. It is another government quango. There used to be an inspector of constabulary, staffed by retired senior officers. The government replaced them with civilians, who in truth haven't got a clue. So we moved away from the situation where fairness was the key word in policing. It was drummed into recruits that they must never be seen to be taking sides in any dispute or demonstration. This even included being instructed not to march in step with any parades. We were taught that our job is to protect people's rights, to express their views and to prevent disorder. Contrast this now to situations where police in uniform actively and overtly support political objectives of campaigning groups like Stonewall or Mermaids. They wear their logos, paint their police cars in their colours and carry their flags. I probably don't need to mention kneeling to Black Lives Matter. This summer, the police stood by where statues were defaced or damaged. In Bristol, there were bobbies available who wanted to go and prevent the statue toppling, but were ordered not to intervene by their chief constable. The police has also actively assisted Extinction Rebellion to block roads and stood by whilst they committed criminal damage in several locations across the country. They have also behaved quite violently towards ex-military veterans and there seems to be a growing antipathy between the two groups. I don't know why, but it does seem to fit the generally woke agenda opposed to anything British or anything traditional. Now I want to add a caveat to what I'm saying. The problems with our police are at the leadership and political level. Many bobbies are appalled at what the police service has become, but they cannot speak out. However, there is quite a network of retiring and serving officers, and I can assure you that most bobbies think like us. So don't think that every bobby you come across is part of the woke left. They are not. However, with the brutal police attack on peaceful demonstrators, most engaged in legitimate protest against illegal immigration or the activities of grooming gangs, the policing of these protests is nothing short of disgraceful and they have frequently resorted to using excessive force. Many of their victims are mature adults, not the stereotypical teenage troublemaker. The oath every police officer makes on appointment is to treat everyone equally, without favour or affection. That oath is no longer observed. The contrast could not be greater when you see the absence of any police at Islamic gatherings and their failure to deal with blatant law-breaking by Black Lives Matter and others. In my opinion, the police actively facilitate left-wing and Islamic protests. But if you only watch the mainstream media, you wouldn't believe me. The police also go out of their way to hide the extent of Islamic terrorism by help, hyping up the threat of so-called right-wing terrorism, which from what I can see is virtually non-existent. The likes of the BBC and Sky do their best to conceal the dual standards of policing. Where would we be without social media and the citizen journalist? We now know how dishonest our media is. So what are we going to do about all this? I actually believe that the police consistently breach Articles 10 and 11 of the Human Rights Convention. These deal with freedom of expression and freedom of assembly and association. Regularly, the police have thwarted our party's attempts to hold meetings, and this started with the very first to hold, attempt to hold a meeting in 2017. Since then, many meetings have been prevented, usually by the police threatening the licenses of venues prepared to host us. I also believe that the police have at least on one occasion disclosed a meeting venue to left-wing groups. It's not just us. 
the police regularly oppose any gatherings that are not organised by the left. There is a remedy, but it would require us to go to court, and in truth we do not have the money to indulge in legal cases. There is no short-term remedy. Our newly revised manifesto explains our long-term plan. The current police leadership is corrupted beyond redemption. They are government placemen. There will be no option but to strip the whole leadership out and replace them with people capable of independent thought, not woke cultural Marxists, but street-savvy, practical coppers. We will abolish the role of police and crime commissioner. We will introduce a Public Sector Accountability Act, which will hold local chiefs to account. We will introduce an elected corporate body to oversee each force. We will reinstate the professional nature of the inspectorate. We will also introduce many other reforms of the criminal justice system. We will take justice out of the hands of politicians. We will abolish the Crown Prosecution Service. We will make the courts locally accountable. We will reverse the outsourcing of policing services. We will also abolish the concept of hate crime, which is being used to stifle free speech. The list is long and the full policies are in our manifesto. Now none of this will happen because of any speeches made or fine words written in manifestos. To bring about change, we must drain the swamp. We must get elected, and that means boots on the ground and candidates. If you believe in what we say, then please do something. If you can stand for us, please do so. If you cannot, at least help with leafleting. And we will always take money if you can't do anything else. For Britain is the only party who understands the big picture. Various single-issue parties come and go, but we are here for the long run. With your help, we will defeat the corrupted system that exists, and we will make Britain great again. We are For Britain. Thank you. Hey, For Britain, this is Scott Ragland. I'm an American member of the party. I'm a member because I love the British people, and I want to make Britain great again. Even more important, I want to make Britain free again. So in the past year, in the UK and here in the US, there's been a massive crackdown on individual liberty in the name of public health. More recently in the US, we've seen an unprecedented assault on our constitutional republic in the electoral process. So... I think the key thing for all of us is that if we want to be free men and women, then we need to speak, think, and act freely. We cannot be intimidated into silence. So God bless you all. Thank you for what you're doing. For Britain is giving me hope for the UK. I do believe that righteousness and truth will ultimately prevail. You know, the enemy is determined, but what makes them tick is hate. They're motivated by hate. We're motivated by love, love of country, love of our heritage. So we've got to believe that love will ultimately prevail. Light will triumph over darkness and love over hate. Thank you very much.